Thank you so much to the team this morning for just uh, leading us in some amazing worship, right? I invite you to close your eyes for a minute here. We're, uh, we're in the book of Revelation. And it's a book with a lot of terrible things in it. A lot of scary stuff. But in Revelation chapter 1, it talks about Jesus. And it describes Jesus. It says that he's powerful. And that he's mighty and he knows everything. And it says that he's coming back. Will you picture him coming in his glory? Will you picture Jesus the king, the conqueror coming back to set things right? To reset the table that, that was messed up and broken by our sin. But in order to come back, in order to, to, to get his kingdom in order, he has to judge what's wrong. And so along with his order comes God's wrath. His righteous wrath. But as we're singing the song, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. That's what's going to be happening. In Revelation, we see the darkness trembling, but the problem with the darkness is that the darkness will not relent. And it won't give in. I invite you to open your eyes here. In John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and later on in verse 14 and 17, it talks about the idea that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word became flesh and made Himself among us. The Word put on human skin, and the Word is Jesus Christ. And in Psalm 119, 105, the psalmist wrote, God, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. In Psalm 119, 130, it says, The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Psalm 33, 4 says, For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. Isaiah 40, verse 8 says, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Jesus, Jesus. He's the Word. He was the Word made flesh. Finally, Matthew 24, verse 35 said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And in Revelation chapter 1, John writes, and, and he writes and he says, Blessed are those who read this Word. Blessed are those who hear this Word. Blessed are those who listen to, who take to heart, who live out the Word. Revelation chapter, Revelation is a letter to God's people directly from the mouth and the presentation, the vision that Jesus is showing to his apostle John. And so we, so we see here in Revelation that the word is written to be read. We see that this is a message of hope. Yes, there are terrible atrocities, but ultimately it's a message of hope because Jesus is coming. Yeah. That was weird. <laughs> For those online, I, I heard myself echo. I, I guess it was somebody's phone listening, but it is. It's a message of hope. Get, get the point, right? I think God wanted us to understand that. Because as we're reading Revelation, we're like getting depressed. <laughs> like, this is terrible. This is not fun. I had one, one person tell me, you know, th this past week, man, these, these messages are really goring and, gory and depressing. And I'm like, yeah, they are. It's a message of hope. Yeah, we have to remember that Jesus makes the darkness tremble. Jesus is the light. Jesus is alive. And it's, his, and it's in his name that we confess and we give our salvation. We, we, we give our hearts and our souls to be saved. So, as, as we're reading this book, as we're going through, we see some things. We're, we're seeing the timeline that happens here, and we see right now that we are living in the orange. We're living in the present age, the, the age of the church, the, the age where we have the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ living in us. Those of us who've given our life to Christ, our, our body is described as the Holy of Holies in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Our body is described as the temple, the Holy of Holies, the naos. 
the place where God presides. We are the church. We are his body. We're living in this orange and we're waiting for the yellow upward arrows. We're waiting for the time when Jesus comes back and he's in the sky and the rapture happens and he says, hey, come on kids, come home. And he brings us to meet him in the air. And that's going to be a great time for us. But for those who are left behind, it's going to be a terrible time and they're going to be living in the blue where it says seven year tribulation. And during that time, there's going to be a lot of terrible things as Jesus is resetting the table as he's judging those that are wrong, but as he's bringing Israel back to himself, his chosen nation. Israel is God's chosen nation. His chosen people. They were presented to be the witnesses, to be the light to the Gentiles, to those who are not Jews, to understand who Christ was. So he's going to come to, set, to reset the table and to, to get them in order. And in his resetting of the table, he's going to bring judgment. Seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls of wrath. We've been through the seven seals. We got through six trumpets. No, we got through seven trumpets. And the intensity escalates with, with each event. Think of a telescope. If I've got a telescope here and I'm looking out and then I open up the next slide, at the, at the seventh point of the seals, you open up another slide and then seven trumpets come out. And as you open up the seventh trumpet, you've got seven bowls of wrath. And that's how this is going to work. That's how, and the damage and the infliction and the wrath just keeps going. And here's the problem though. As God's wrath is coming, as Jesus' name is making the darkness tremble, the darkness refuses to give in. And it shows us the depraved state of our heart. Humanity's reaction to God's judgment reveals that we are truly depraved, that we are so lost without Jesus Christ and His love and His mercy and His grace. That in the midst of terrible things happening, of of half the world's population dying off, people still refuse to give in to God. We finish Revelation 9, verse 20 and 21 with this, and it said, The rest of mankind who were not killed by the the plagues, they still did not repent. They continued worshiping demons. They didn't repent of their murder, their magic arts, their sexual immorality. They did not repent. And so as we're reading and we finished up chapter 9, we all walk out of here with our heads down. It's like, oh, this is terrible. Thanks a lot, John, for putting all this in there. But you see, God's a great writer. Because he wrote this through the pen of John. But he understood that we need a break. <laughs> he understood there are times that you just need a little lift of encouragement. You've got you to come out of the, the darkness. You've got to come out of the sadness a little bit. So we've read of suffering of billions. And then we get an interlude. Now there is some violence and destruction in this interlude, but in it we see some special things. We're introduced to a mighty angel, who I believe is Michael, the archangel. But... We can't be sure. But one thing I can tell you is this angel in chapter 10 is not Jesus Christ. This messenger is not Jesus Christ. It's it's an angel of God who represents Jesus Christ. We're introduced to an angel. We're introduced to a little scroll. We're introduced to two witnesses. And we go with the second woe. So, Revelation 10 verse 1, it says... John, John was, he was seeing all the atrocities happen and then all of a sudden he's taken from heaven's view and he's taken back down to earth and he sees something coming down. It says, then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun and his legs were like fiery pillars. See, John's changed his location from the heavenly throne room to earth. God says, I want to show you something. And so, as we read of this this mighty angel that comes down, it says he was holding a little scroll, which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. So this angel, it's not like he was standing at the seashore and it was like, oh, this foot's getting wet, this foot's not. No, he's this huge, mighty, towering thing. And this is not an analogy. It's not... Uh, illustrative or it's not a sign it's not it's not fake it, it's actually what he sees it's what's happening it says he's he sees this this angel 
He planted his right foot on the sea, he's humongous, and he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And I, I don't know what these seven thunders are. I don't know if they're seven angels that have just been like waiting for something. I really don't know. But I know that whatever happened when this angel spoke, it was like the sound of a roaring lion. Anyone ever been to the zoo and heard the lion roar? Like when a lion roars, when it really roars, do you have to be right next to it to hear it? No, you're far. You could be on the other side of the zoo. And when that thing roars, everybody's like, oh, he's moving around. Let's go run over there and see if we can see him. And then you get there and he's lying down. But a lion's roar, it's loud. And it's scary. And it's introducing his presence. And as we read this, as you look at this, I remind you that this Revelation chapter 10 angel is, is not Jesus Christ. It's an angel. Even though it's said there that he was robed in, in verse 1. What it says? It says he's robed in a rainbow, a cloud with a rainbow above his head. You know, it sounds like descriptions of Jesus Christ from, from chapter 1, right? Revelation chapter 1. But it's not Jesus. What it's pointing to is the fact that this angel is the representative of Jesus. He's massive. He reaches the sky. He's grand. He reflects the attributes of the Son of God. And he gets down here and he lets out a terrifying cry. I want you to think about something. It's so easy when we read this stuff to think like otherworldly, not really going to happen, or maybe it's not quite like it looks. I'm telling you, if this happened and you were on the beach that day and you saw this massive angel come down and have his feet on dry land and his feet on the ocean, you would be terrified. And then he speaks and lets out a cry like the roar of a lion. You would be terrified. There's no reporter in the right mind that would be comfortable standing in that situation. You know, with the angel as the backdrop. No, I'm getting out of here. You see, because they've seen all sorts of things that have been, been happening. But what we see is that this angel is bringing God's word and he's coming down in a picture of authority. And he shouts... And then John continues, he says, then, I had, then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it. And what did he say? What does he say? This is the important part of chapter 10. This is what we have to understand when you're reading through these chapters. What is it really? Okay, so there's a big angel, and then he's got like God's word in a scroll, but what is the point of it? The point of it is there. He says, there will be no more delay. <laughs> I have to be honest. The first time as I was reading this through and studying for this, I was like, no more delay. Like, <laughs> what do we think has been happening? Just read through all sorts of people getting killed, all sorts of crazy things happening to the planet and the universe. I mean, this is nuts. Like, what? Of course there was no delay. No. It's more than that. There's going to be no more delay. And as you continue reading in chapter 10, you see that this, the delay that it's talking about is the mystery of God being revealed. The fact that Jesus Christ is coming. The final stages are being set for Jesus to enter this atmosphere, to enter this world, to come down on the Mount of Olives and take charge of everything. But something interesting happens after this delay. This, he's, when when the, the angel says that there will be no more delay, he, he calls John over to himself. And John is like, uh, okay, so I'm going to go over here. And in verse 9, it says, John says, So I went to the angel and I asked him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. And John says, I took the scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. 
Why? How can you eat something? This isn't Sour Patch Kids. I was looking for Sour Patch Kids around the house last night. That somebody had eaten all of them. The kids ate them. But this isn't like, like sweet and then sour like that. Because even the sourness is enjoyable. This is something worse. This is something bad. Why? What is the scroll that he's eating? Was the scroll that he's eating is the words of God. God's, God's message. God's something that he has for him. And he says, I want you to ingest this. I want you to take it all in. I want you to internalize it because something's going to happen as you internalize this word. And as a commitment, it's going to taste sweet. It's going to be something that as as you take in my word and and what's going to be happening, you're going to think, this is awesome. This is great. God, Jesus is coming. And there's a sweetness to that, right? And we can sing, Jesus, Jesus, your name is alive and we love you and you're the light and all this stuff. But the thing is, there's a side of it who's not singing, Jesus, Jesus, you're alive and I love you. There's a side who says, Jesus, I don't care who you are and I hate you. And see, John is eating the scroll of the words. That he sees what's coming and what's going to be happening and, and he takes it in. And verse 11 says, Then I was told you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. This, this angel gives him the word of God, this special message for him, and he says, don't stop prophesying. You must tell people. So I want you to internalize what God's got for your life. And I want you to tell people about what's coming. The message of the gospel, the message of the fact that Jesus is is the light of the world, the message of the fact that that Jesus comes and gives us salvation is a sweet, sweet message. But for those who say no to Jesus Christ, it's a message of sour doom. And in this, as we were going through it, we understood that God's word must be absorbed into our lives must be internalized so that we can live in his word. In, in Revelation 1, it says, you know, read the word, hear the word, speak the word, and live it. Got to internalize it in order to live it. Got to internalize it in order to share it. In Revelation verse 11 says, you must tell people. And this is the takeaway. This is the takeaway from that chapter as we're we're looking at chapter 10 and trying to understand why it matters. Why does it matter to understand God's word? Why does it matter to internalize it, to take it in? Because it means something. Because your life and your eternity Depends on it. God's word's got to be absorbed into our life because there's no time like the present to turn to God. Repent and get right with him. You know, I read some, some sad news yesterday that an actor that, um, that, I, that I liked, I enjoyed watching. Anyone ever seen Elf? Yeah, we've seen the movie Elf. You know, James Caan was, was the, the biological father in that, in that, in that movie. Um, he did a great job of looking like he didn't care, and then his life, tr- and then he turned around, and he really loved his son, Buddy the Elf. But um, James Caan died a couple days ago. Today's the 10th. He died on the 6th. And I, and I missed it, and I saw it, and I read it yesterday, and I was like, oh, this is sad. Let me, let me read his obituary, what they say about him. And as I read it, I got really sad. He's a person I don't know. I didn't love him or anything. But he read, as you read his, his life, he, he, he went through four marriages. Married and divorced four times. Five kids from those marriages. But when it all boiled down to it, when, it, when he talked about his life and he talked about kind of his purpose and what he enjoyed and what he was living for, he said something along the lines, I live for sex and drugs. And that's what I love. He died a few days ago, and I, didn't, I couldn't find anything, and I was hoping something would come across that maybe he was in a church somewhere. Maybe something happened in his life where he finally found what he was really seeking his satisfaction in, which is Jesus Christ. But today, it's too late. Today, it's too late for James Conn. There's no time like the present to turn to God to repent and get right with him. 
I don't know if he's in eternity with Christ or not. But that's somebody we don't know. How many of us know someone who's passed just recently? We all are either going to die or be raptured. We're all going to be bowing our knees before Jesus Christ one day. The question is, in that moment, is he going to be for you or is he going to be against you? Like, when it comes to that moment, when you're before Jesus, on your, on your knees before him, and you're looking at him, we can sing, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble all we want. But he's going to either say, I knew you, I know you, or I don't. There's no getting around it at that point. The decision you make before you step into eternity is what matters. And so if you're in this room today and you're like, well, I haven't actually confessed Jesus Christ as my Lord. I haven't committed my life to him. He's not the Lord and Savior of my life. I'm going to wait until I really know for sure that that's what I want. I'm going to wait until maybe I get on my deathbed. Or I'm going to wait until I, I feel like I'm in a situation where I really need him. We don't know when those times are. We don't know if we walk out of here and get in our car and get into an accident on 81 and die. We don't know. At the same time, there are those of us who've said, yes, I'm going to be on my knees before Jesus, worshiping him that day, and he's going to say, get up, faithful servant. I, I love you. I'm so proud of you. Enter into the gates of heaven. And, and we're like excited because we know that that day's going to come. But the problem is there are going to be people that we're interacting with on a regular basis, that are touching our hands, that we're spending time with on a regular basis, who will not be in a position where Jesus says, well done. He's going to be in a position where Jesus says, you're going to hell. You are going to the lake of fire because of your sin and your refusal to accept me as your Lord and Savior. So as we're reading through Revelation and we're, we're, we're hearing about this terrible stuff, we need to remember there's no time like today, this moment, in your seat right now, or be praying for your friends who don't know Christ and talk to them because you don't know when the last breath is going to happen for any person. We don't know if the rapture is going to happen. As we uh, continue here in, 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 in chapter 10 and, and then jump into chapter 11, one of the things that we were looking at, one of the things that, that, that I pointed out the first time through this it was, was this idea that we have to trust and put our confidence and our faith in God. The reason we don't turn to God, the reason we don't repent, the reason we don't get right with Him is because we don't have confidence in Him. Because we question and say, well, God wasn't there for me when. God wasn't there for my family when. God wasn't there for my loved one when this thing happened. And so God not, must not be who He is. And see, we place our faith and we put our confidence in a God that we've designed and made up of our own because we think he must, he's got to be this person that does everything for us. That Remember, he's the vending machine God. I'm going to put in a quarter. I expect to get a, hand, a candy bar. That's not who God is. You see, we can't even understand the machine. We can't even understand fully who God is, but we do know that God knows what's going on and that God's in control and that he's got his timing and he's looking at our life and he knows what's best. And what happens when we start to, to build up a God of our own, we make a God who's too small. And we can't have confidence in that God. And every crack in our faith is rooted in a shrinking confidence in God. Every time that we say, I'm going to do this instead of what God wants, it's because we don't have confidence in Him. And you say, well, that's not really true. I just want to do what I want. Well, maybe you want to do what you want. Maybe I want to do what I want because I think I know better than God. And when, when I think I know better than God, then I don't have confidence that God knows better than me. See what I'm saying? But in chapter 11, we see some really interesting things happen. We see that God has a plan of love and mercy. We see that God continues to fight for those who, who will be His. In the midst of the terrible stuff. Verse 
Revelation 11, 3 and 4 says, And I will appoint my two witnesses. And they will prophesy for 1,260 days. That's three and a half years. They will prophesy for three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. They're going to be clothed in this, wearing clothes, just like in the Old Testament times. At the time that this was written, when John wrote this, the sackcloth and ashes bit was kind of over. People didn't really do that anymore. People didn't put on sackcloth. They didn't, they didn't wear sackcloth because it was uncomfortable. They didn't wear sackcloth because it meant that they were miserable or they understood the despair and the misery that was around them that was coming. And they didn't want to give in to their ego on that. But John wrote this and he said, there's going to come a day that two witnesses are going to come in the midst of these terrible times and they're going to be running around and they're going to be doing things. They're going to be clothed in sackcloth. They're the two olive trees and the two lampstands and they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. And what's interesting in this is that these two witnesses, they're kind of unstoppable. Not kind of, they are. They're going to be standing around the wailing wall. They're going to be witnessing in Jerusalem. First three and a half years of the tribulation. They're going to be telling people, Jesus is Lord and Savior. Jesus is Lord and Savior. Repent from your sin. Repent of your sin. Turn around. Don't follow the Antichrist. Don't follow the ways of the world. And they're going to keep saying this. And people are going to be like, how dare you say this? And they're going to try to kill him. And maybe the first couple times it... Somebody tries to go and then, you know, maybe some guns. I don't know what they're doing. And it's all over CNN. The assassination attempt. And all of a sudden, these guys shoot fire out of their mouth and just wipe out the whole multitude of whoever's coming at them. It's crazy. It's like the stuff out of movies. Except it'll be even more clear then. But they have a message that will not be stopped. God will not allow their message to stop until they're done giving the message that he wants them to give. He wants people to come to him. And when we put our confidence in a God who's coming after us and pursuing us and pursuing our loved ones, then that's when we um, kind of step back from ourselves and are more willing to go all out. Showing up at a car wash on a Wednesday night saying, how's that going to bring people to Jesus? I don't know, but it will. Maybe one of those people who we prayed for the other night was impacted in a special way. Maybe somebody drove by and saw a group of people smiling and laughing together and said, I, I need that relationship. I need that connection. Maybe they're looking us up. I don't know. But if God has a message for us to give, do you think that he's going to let that message stop before he's ready for it to be stopped? These two witnesses, they had the power to do some amazing things and to shut people up. And so as I was reading this, I was just thinking, so if that's what he's going to do in that day during terrible times, we have the Holy Spirit of God living in us now, what what do we need to do? Well, don't fear that I'm not qualified. (laughs) I can't share the message. I don't know what to say. I can't share the message because look at my life, look at how I've lived. Look at my past. I can't share the message because I'm not eloquent. I don't know enough. I'm not going to share the message because, you know, it won't work for that person. I'm not going to share the message. I'm not going to tell people that I love Jesus because they might reject me. The two witnesses continue for three and a half years giving the message amidst all of this stuff. We're empowered by the same Holy Spirit that's going to empower them that day. You know, we live in a nation in a time where maybe we don't see the Holy Spirit's sign gifts as much as maybe other nations see. Because we're so independent. We're so dependent on ourselves. 
But how awesome would it be if we could see and sense the Holy Spirit in a real way? If we understand how big God is and we understand the Holy Spirit is God and the Holy Spirit is living in us, then just maybe we won't have cracks in our faith. We'll have confidence in an all-powerful God. So it continues in verse 7 and says, Now when they have finished their testimony, the beast, this is the Antichrist, comes up from the abyss. He will attack them and overpower and kill them. So the Antichrist is going to come on the scene. Three and a half years in, he's going to come on the scene. Nobody's been able to defeat these two witnesses. They're sharing, they're sharing, they're sharing. There are 144,000 Jewish witnesses running around and telling people about Jesus Christ as well. And so you've got 144,000 and two. And so they're telling all these people, everything is happening, and people are getting saved. People are committing their life to Christ. And the Antichrist comes riding into town, and he says, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to shut him up. And something happens. God says, all right, your message is done. You've given the message. You're good. Now I'm going to take, I'm going to take the safety off of you for a moment. And it says the Antichrist will attack them, overpower them, and kill them. And it says their bodies will lie in the streets, in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. So it's Jerusalem. And then it says for three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, nation, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth, Remember the inhabitants, the evil people, those who have not committed their life to Christ. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them, will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. It will be a new holiday. They will be so excited. They are killed. They gave the message. They were killed for giving the message. They suffered for giving the message. And so the takeaway was continue God's call even when sharing the truth hurts. Continue God's call even when living for God breaks your plan of success. Continue God's call even when others around you are falling. That's the example that we see here. Continue to call out to God, and we've got to remember we've got the same spirit in us that is empowering those people in the future. The spirit of the all-powerful God. Because of this, after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered these two witnesses, and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. So for three and a half days, the world is excited. They're having the biggest party they've had. And CNN is on site. And they're interviewing people left and right. Were you here? Did you see the day, the day that this Antichrist, the day that he took them out? Did you see the day that that quote-unquote Messiah took out these two m- m- witnesses? And they're interviewing somebody like this. And they're looking at them. And the person is over here talking. They're, they got their 15 seconds of fame, right? Oh, yeah, I was here. I saw it. And all of a sudden, the camera starts to pan away. It's all movement. See, it's movement on the hand of the witness who's been rotting in the street for three and a half days. Then he sees his feet. Then he sees him sit up like something out of a crazy movie, right? You're all picturing it. They got their tattered sackcloth. All of a sudden, they sit up straight. Maybe they help one another up. They stand up. It says, they stood to their feet and terror struck those who saw them. All of a sudden, the cameraman drops the camera and runs. And the whole world is like, what's going on? Everybody's looking at their cell phones. It says, then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. It's a parallel. Who else rose from death to life after three days? Jesus Christ. And he was called to heaven. Jesus Christ was God's witness on earth. You see, God has witnesses. As long as Satan is running around, God will have witnesses on this earth to his glory and his greatness, to God's glory, to God's greatness, to God's grace, to God's gospel, to our salvation. 
And so the takeaway was smile as you obey his commission because you know it's for him. And he's the only one worth living for. We've got to give our lives to the message of Christ. We've got to pray for revival. We've got to continue to tell people of, of who he is. Because we don't want them to suffer the atrocities that are going to happen that we see here in this book. And then chapter 11 continues to move, and it moves to verse 15, and it says, The seventh angel sounded his trumpet. So finally we get the seventh trumpet, the final trumpet. He sounded, and there was a loud voice in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Remember how I started the message when we talked about the idea that there will be no more delay? In this interlude, a loud voice says, hey, (laughs) it's here. The kingdom is coming. John 12, 31 says, the time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of the world, will be cast out. Jesus is coming. And so the question, if his kingdom is is arriving in this moment, the question that will be asked of everyone who's alive on earth at that time is in the presence of God. He'll either be for us or against us. Will he be for you or will he be against you? He's for those who are his. He's against those who are his enemies. And John continues and he sees and he says, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. And something happens in Jerusalem there. And 7,000 people die. 10% of the city is ruined. He's looking and he's getting this picture. You know, there are people looking around this day looking for the ark of the covenant on on the earth. They're, they're architect, you know, archaeologists are digging and, and looking. Oh, I think this is where the Ark of the Covenant is. It's really, how does the Ark of the Covenant, how could it be found here on earth if it says right there, it's in heaven? The Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God, it's in his throne room and John gets to see it. But at the same time, this powerful, mighty situation is arising. Jesus is coming, here's the coronation, here's the lightning, the rumbling, the peals of thunder, an earthquake so big that that 7,000 people die, people are terrified. And again, the takeaway, there's no time like the present to turn to God to repent and get right with Him. We've just moved through a couple chapters on the recap. When we get into the next chapter, we're going we're gonna to see some analogy because the, John writes, hey, this is a sign. <laughs> but right now, up to this point, this stuff is happening for real. And so the question we're left with is this. Is God for me or is he against me? Have I committed to God or have I not? Do I know people who have not committed to God? Am I doing everything I can to bridge the gap. That's what we want to be about here at Bridge Church. Worship team, we're going to come up. We're going to sing. We're going to sing a song that we know called God of Revival. And the reason we sing this song is because revival can happen. In fact, it says here in Revelation, chapter, in Revelation we see the idea that revival is happening all over the earth. We saw the 144,000 who are going around telling people about Jesus Christ. And then we see the multitude of those who are saved, those who have given their life to him. So we know that the revival is going to make a difference. And the thing is, the revival still makes a difference now. But in order for the revival to happen, we've got to remember what Romans 10 says. Romans 10, 13, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they believe on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? How can people know about Christ if we're not preaching? And then it says, And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? 
As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. We serve a God of revival. The God of revival is living in us. Are we being the bridge to bring that revival to others? Are we holding Jesus all for ourselves? Will you stand with me, please? If you're in here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I promise you, I promise you, the words in this book are real. The words in this are real. This is God's word. If you were to die today, you would spend an eternity separated from God in a place called hell and the lake of fire. That is the worst possible pain that will never stop. Never stop. If you don't know Christ, you need him now. There's no special formula. Right before these verses in Romans 10, it says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So you make him the Lord of your life. And we all have friends who need Christ. Jesus is coming. The King is coming. Do we want to see revival? Yes, we do. Let's pray. Dear God, I pray this morning as we end in this dismissing song, God, a revival, that we'll believe that you have the power to save those who we think are unsavable. That we'll believe that you can save us even if we think that we're not worthy because you laid your life down for us. Revive our hearts this morning, God. Those of us in this room who need to be uh, recharged and refreshed, give us a spirit of refreshment. For those of us in this room that need to be empowered to share your word and your message with others, give us the empowered spirit. For those of us that need to meet Jesus for the first time, I pray the handshake happens and that we'll fall in love with our Savior. You're the God of revival. Let's see what you can do. Amen.